Well, my next guests are a fast-rising group called Austra. They've recently released their debut album. The Toronto Trio combined the beat and pulse of electronic music with the classically charged vocal stylings of founder Katie Stelmanis. Katie grew up in classical music. She joined the Canadian Children's Opera Chorus at the age of 10, made multiple appearances with the Canadian Opera Company, and trained in viola and piano. She left classical music in her late teens via the post-punk band Galaxy and a solo stint that resulted in the the 2008 record, Join Us. Nowadays, Katie has joined forces with drummer Maya Postepsky and bassist Dorian Wolf to form Austria. And there's quite a story developing here. Long before their debut record dropped yesterday, Austria began drawing international attention from the likes of Italian Vogue, NME, and Vanity Fair, and also international comparisons to the likes of Bjork, PJ Harvey, Kate Bush, and The Knife. Not so bad. For me, there's some solid Susie and the Banshees sounds in there, which I would, not, would say only as a major compliment. The album Feel It Break was released yesterday to much anticipation, and today Katie Stelmanis and Alistair are with me in Studio Q. Hello. Hello. What a pleasure it is to have you guys here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so tell me this story. You, you spent the better part of a decade embedded in the classical music world. What was it about that kind of music that drew you in at a young age? I don't know. I think I kind of just ended up playing classical music by default. I just, it was pretty obvious that I loved music and I loved singing and it was just natural as a kid, like 10 years old, to just take piano lessons and join choirs. And I don't think there was really, you know, a reason behind it. It was just kind of what was there and what was accessible. And then I just kind of loved every instrument that I played and picked up and just kind of went as far as I could with it. Were your parents encouraging you to get into classical music or opera? No, not at all. <laughs> they um, were they di- discouraging you. <laughs> they weren't discouraging right. me, but I mean, they did. They they never pushed me to do anything. Like I think that there came a time in my life. I mean, I guess I started singing and playing piano relatively late compared to a lot of kids that would consider themselves to be serious classical musicians. You know, you get the kids that start when they're like three, four years old. Right. I started when I was ten, and I mean, I think that it was. I mean, I don't really remember, but I'm sure it was pretty obvious that I really wanted to take music lessons. And so eventually my parents just kind of like gave in and got me a piano. They took you out of karate and put you in piano lessons. Literally. Yeah, I was in karate. Were you really? I was really bad at it. You really were? I was just guessing. I was in, oh, I was in, actually, it was taekwondo. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Be realistic. That's pretty good. <laughs> Be realistic. Yeah. Well, and and the, the opera part is really interesting to me. So you... You, I mean, outside your instrumental training and the piano and the instruments that you were enjoying, what, what did opera mean to you when you were 10 years old and in your early teens? Well, I mean, I think that opera kind of happened by accident as well. Like, I joined the Canadian Children's Opera Chorus, which was just the choir that I happened to become a part of as well. I mean, this is how I see it, at least. I'm, I'm, I don't know if my mother would say something differently. But, um, yeah, and it was just... In that choir, we were the kids that would perform with the Canadian Opera Company in their full stage projections. So, you know, I was in like Hansel and Gretel, La Boheme, like all these productions when I was like 10, 11, 12, up until I was around 15. And I think just being on the stage in that experience is just a completely different way of listening to opera. And I think that I acquired a taste for it at a very young age because, I mean, most people... My parents don't really have a taste for it. Like most people that I know, it's it's definitely an acquired taste. Like you have to give it a chance. You have to like learn to love it. You got to get into the zone, and then once yeah. you're in the zone, you're like, oh my god, this is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. But did did music was music a what was music to you as a teenager? Was it an escape? Was it something where you really found yourself? Was it your comfort zone? What was it? I think it was all of those things. Like it was definitely an escape. I mean, I I'd spent. It was it was like a private thing and a social thing for me. Like a private, I would I mean I would play piano for like four or five hours a day, kind of thing. Like I was just, I could just spend so much time on the piano. Whereas everything else in my life, I feel like I have a very short attention span. And uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it, I would call it an escape. I would call it something. I mean, I was really extremely driven. I was really competitive. I was really again like being in the choir. It was like my social life. Like I loved sort of the competitions. I loved. I just loved everything about it. And now, I mean, here you are on the precipice of, well, you've just put out this record, and you are already getting all this international attention. Is Did you foresee this? Is this something you wanted when you were a kid? Did you have the hairbrush in front of the mirror, and you're singing and going, I can be, you know, I don't know, 
Britney Spears or whatever <laughs> you'd think when you were six? Well, I definitely didn't see myself being Britney Spears. I mean, <laughs> up until like my late teens, I just saw myself pursuing a career in classical music, like whatever form that would be. Right. But I always knew that I would be playing music in whatever capacity it happened in. So making the jump from classical to so, so, so like Britney Spears, but with a violin in their hands. Well, yeah, sure, I guess so. I'm, I'm making fun of myself. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so making the jump from classical to electronic, it, like that doesn't seem like an obvious one. How did you first gra- gravitate to this more electronic sound that we hear on this record? Well, it's funny. I feel like electronic music has more in common with classical music than a lot of other kind of pop genres because. With electronic music, you can do so much with it in like the arrangements and the writing. And you can use tons of different sounds, lots of different samples. Whereas, you know, when you're, if you're in like a four-piece rock band, you're kind of limited to like the instruments in a four-piece rock band. I mean, obviously, people get really creative and bring in lots of different sounds. But I just find with electronic music, like your possibilities are kind of endless hmm. in terms of what you can do. And I mean, I originally got into it because. When I was 18 or 19, I wanted to write orchestral music. And the easiest way for me to do that was to buy a MIDI controller where I could trigger, you know, like violin samples, cello samples. So that's how I started working with computers at all, because I wanted to make classical music. In a recent interview, you also said, uh, Katie, that part of the reason you left opera in your teens is that it's a super hetero world. And that as a lesbian, you didn't feel like you fit into it. Uh, Do you you think that's still true of that world uh, a decade or so on? You know, I feel like it's been such a long time that I've ever I spent time in that world that I can't really say. I think that the way I felt when I was a teenager, 18 or 19, that I felt like there it wasn't really a place for me in it. I mean, I just I just have memories of, you know, going to the competitions and and being made to wear like a floor-length ball gown or that kind hmm. of thing, you know, and it's hmm. like you if you don't buy into this aesthetic, like you just won't be accepted like you 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 need to wear these outfits you need to like it's just there's just a certain standard of like the way you need to be in that culture and and i partly asked the question because you're talking about this now you said that you previously wanted to separate your music from your sexuality but now you think there's there needs to be a wide variety wider variety of queer representation in music a what changed for you and b why do you believe this well i think that when i first started out in music um, you know, like five or six years ago, like in my first band, Galaxy, I just, politics and music, they just didn't, they, they never met for me. Like it, it wasn't even an issue. Like my first band, Galaxy, um, our third member, Emma McKenna, was very political and like the lyrics were very political and she wanted it to be like a message, like a band with a message. Whereas me and Maya, who's also in that band, we were just like, we're just musicians. We just want to play music. Like, mm. we don't care about this stuff. We play our instruments, whatever. But I think that, so that was kind of like my original attitude. I was like, and because I was, I mean, I was been a musician way longer than I've identified as gay or been a part of like any queer community. I mean, I've been a musician for my entire life. Mm-hmm. And so in that sense, like it had come into my life second. But I think being in music for however long I've been in music, it's become more obvious to me that it's important to recognize it. I think like I just just seeing how other artists and how in general, like the music industry treats issues regarding to like homosexuality or whatever. I think that it's 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 made it clear to me that it is actually kind of important to at least like have a stand on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I just, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> I, 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 I want to make sure we have enough time to hear you, you guys play. I, I just got to say quickly, I mean, it must be flattering to get all these comparisons, but what, what do you make of the fact that, I mean, there's prestigious publications saying, you know, dropping names like Kate Bush and, and, and Susie and the Banshees and, and, and Bjork. Uh, how does that feel? It feels good. I mean, they're all artists that I love and I definitely have always admired and been influenced by so i think it's i mean it's good to be compared to artists that you like you feel the pressure of expectations no i wouldn't say so all right now that we've compared you to bjork and kate bush you better <laughs> not suck like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i think a lot of people get compared to those artists that kind of definitely don't live up to them so i think people are kind of used to that happening <laughs> all right that's so, a good disclaimer well yeah. listen it, it's such an impressive record i i thank you and the band for being here